My friends, welcome. Today I want to talk about a very big problem with very small things, and those are genetically engineered microbes. Synthetic biology. Synthetic life, we've even heard it called. In fact, we've heard a lot about this unholy alliance between biotech and nanotech and biodigital convergence somehow fueling the fourth industrial revolution, which will, as Klaus Schwab says, change us from the inside. What's he talking about? What does that mean? And more to the point, would it surprise you to learn that this battle to replace natural biology with biodigital nonsense is already begun? Not with us, but here in the soil. In fact, more than 15 million acres of U.S. farmland, which is more than 2% of it already, has seen synthetic, genetically engineered microbes deployed to it. They're just wiping out that intricate web of life that we've talked about, that Elaine Ingram has studied for years and talked about, that enables agriculture and fundamentally makes possible life on the planet. Nah, we don't need that anymore. We're going to get rid of it, and we're going to shove in these bare patented Roundup-slinging, nitrogen-fixing, synthetic microbes that have any number of untold effects on the health of the plant and the people that eat those plants, and that, of course, will make the farmers dependent on those inputs for the rest of time. And that's just the beginning. Uh, the, the more we dig into this, we'll see that uh, these microbes are also being used to construct a planetary-scale biosurveillance system. But that's a lot to talk about, so let's get started. I'm Christian, and this is the World Economic Forum making it very clear that synthetic biology is now firmly on the global agenda. It begs the question, what is synthetic biology? Imagine like programming life the same way you'd you know, program a computer. Yeah. Like uh, you need, let's say, a new perfume. Mm -hmm. No yeah. problem, right? You just code a microbe and it just like whips up the perfect scent. Wow. That's that is the kind of mind blowing potential of this whole field of synthetic biology. Yeah. Wow, indeed. That is mind-blowing. So if I want a new perfume, all I have to do is take my microbes and... No, I'm not, I'm not buying this euphemistic style explanation. And I'll tell you why. It's because I know that when the World Economic Forum themselves learned about the microbiome, in this case, they invited several experts from Cornell, which we can read from Cornell's own newsletter here, went over to Davos and announced that microbes, in a very real sense here, rule the world. I'm pretty sure that's all old Klausy had to hear before he said, well, if I must rule the microbes to rule the world, and thus launched their microbiome initiative and synthetic biology initiatives. They also said that we can use microbiomes to promote the health of ourselves and favored animals, and simultaneously to target pests that threaten agriculture or forestry. Even that can sound pretty good, but then we have to remind ourselves, who is it here that's determining what is a favored animal and what is a pest? Because if it's the decidedly anti-human World Economic Forum, uh, which tells us that we're just hackable animals and free will is a thing of the past and you're going to own nothing, or if it's the other folks that are investing billions of dollars right now into the microbiome, like this World Microbiome Partnership, which is affiliated with the One Health Alliance, which is linked with the Gates Foundation. These are decidedly some institutional, anti-human, depopulationist, eugenics-style folks. And if it's they that's getting to tell us whether or not we are a favored animal or a pest, it might be worth thinking about this a little bit more. Um, but this perfume example is sort of the way they think about it. Here, in a slightly better version of the language, is uh, Sham Sankar, who is still CTO of Palantir and is now chairman of the board of Ginkgo Biosciences. The mission of Ginkgo is to make biology easier to engineer. And if you kind of squint at it, you can think of a cell as a computer. You, know, you, you put in code and you get out product. It is the future of manufacturing where you can program a cell, provide it feedstock like sugar water, and you can get product out of it. Now, you can find that video and a written format of this report on my website at unshadowed.org. And if you appreciate this broadcast, if you value this information, please help me keep it running by subscribing there. But we just heard from the CTO of Palantir, who's also the chairman of the board of Ginkgo Biosciences, 
espousing that same basic philosophy as we heard in the uh, perfume example, where we can just hijack biology and have the cell create whatever we want for our own purposes. The hubris of these people is off the charts. And that's why when his CEO uh, of Ginkgo, a guy named Jason Kelly, tweets this about farmland, we can see the same philosophy. He says, the agricultural production in the U.S. is an untapped manufacturing base, quote, for more than just food production. Biotechnology will unlock it. And he also says, this is a great way to increase profit margins for farmers. And there's a reason he's tipping that, and that's because farmers are in really bad shape right now. This just came out today from AgWeb. Outraged farmers blame the ag monopolies as catastrophic collapse looms. Farmers are desperate for fundamental change. And that's because down here we read banks are forecasting farm bankruptcies at 25 to 40 percent this year. We're going to lose more than a quarter of the farms in the U.S. That is a catastrophic collapse. That's because conditions have been made systematically, economically unviable to produce food in this country. And farmers' backs are up against the wall. There's a part in here that talks, this, these are sixth generation farmers, right? So going back in his family, as far as he knows, this is what they've done. And now it's the end of the line for farming as we know it. Unless they take these special biomanufacturing incentives. But I digress. I want to focus right now on these microbes. I mentioned that 15 million acres, 2% of U.S. farmland, already has genetically engineered microbes on it, which is just, it's, it's crazy to even say. It's hard to believe when I hear myself saying it. But here it is, announced from Pivot Biosciences. Their product, which is ironically called Proven, even though there's no field studies and there's no way to unapply it and there's no way to contain it. Yeah, it's called Proven, and it is a genetically modified nitrogen-fixing uh, microbe. The way they did this was they went in with their CRISPR scissors and they just cut out a couple genes and saw what happened. And actually in one of their own pivot papers that they put out, they said, we didn't know what was going to happen, but it turns out that these microbes now fix nitrogen no matter what. I don't want to get too technical, but it, I think it's important that we appreciate what's going on here. The microbe they took in nature will sense its environment, right? So if, if there's no nitrogen in the soil, it gets to work and it starts fixing nitrogen. But if it hits a certain threshold, the microbe says, my work here is done, and it stops. The microbe, once they've... Actually, before I even go on, that's a pretty critical piece of information, that microbes are capable of sensing their environment and modifying their behavior based on that environment. That's how they're able to be instrumentalized and even weaponized into biosurveillance systems. But again, getting too far ahead, the microbe that they genetically engineered doesn't even look around. It just fixes nitrogen no matter what. So they took the governor off these microbes. Folks, this is the most benign example. The more interesting ones are the microbes that are engineered to exude peptides that are inspired by spider venom. So they splice spider genes into microbes, and then that's supposed to kill bugs by creating, sp I mean, really like Frankenstein level things here. In fact, let's dip now more into the risks of, um, of genetically engineered microbes. So this is a report from the Friends of the Earth that's all about the risks and concerns of genetically engineered microbes. And the top one I want to mention is this. As if everything we've heard isn't already crazy enough, these GE microbes are antibiotic resistant. We read here, quote, antibiotic resistance markers are commonly used in the development of transgenic organisms. Scientists often add genes that code for resistance to antibiotics so that GE organisms and cells can be distinguished from non-GE ones. I mean, we could have just changed their color or something, maybe. No, we made them antibiotic resistant. So not only is there no containment strategy, not only do we have no long-term studies on this, not only is there no way to get them back out of the field and into the bottle, you can't kill them, right? I, I, I'm sorry that I'm laughing. It's just, it's so over the top that, like I said, I can't believe the words that I'm saying. And yet, 15 million acres of this, it's, it's already out there. All right, so the report also speaks to the scale of the release. They mentioned that over 5 trillion microbes per acre of soil are deployed. 
It's the equivalent of doing heart surgery with a wrecking ball. There's just no, it's just completely flooding the zone with this synthetically, uh, unkillable, synthetically modified uh, microbes. And then a big one here that I want to talk about is horizontal gene transfer. From the report, microbes are capable of horizontal gene transfer. That's DNA from one organism being incorporated into the genome of another organism, sometimes completely unrelated. Um, this happens a lot with microbes. So again, th we already heard from Pivot themselves saying we had no idea what was going to happen and we still don't really know what it, right now it's putting nitrogen in. So the corn is growing. So put it on more um, beyond even that first generation of things that are that are deliberately genetically altered those genes find their way like the spider venom thing just imagine these peptides for spider venom start getting spat out by your stomach because the microbes can hitch a ride on the plant or become integrated into the plant and then make their way into your gut where just very briefly i want to take uh, show you a couple of studies it's well documented that horizontal gene transfer happens all the time in our guts in our gut microbiome so here's one paper that's talking about the constant sharing of genetic materials and microorganisms in the human microbiota. It's not just one or two transfers here and there. No, it's they literally describe it as a network of constantly moving genetic information. So to put spider peptides or random things that help you fix nitrogen um, into your microbiome, now we're starting to get to where Klaus Schwab said, this is the fourth industrial revolution changing you from the inside one more paper on that here's uh, a, a study that that literally calls out the main mechanism of the bacterial evolution in you is horizontal gene exchange so this, this isn't just some fringe risk that maybe it could happen and we should be careful no, no this is constantly happening inside your body all throughout the soil everywhere in nature and to just put microbes out there with crazy changes because you want to turn farmland into your own industrial manufacturing base for pharmaceutical ingredients or for any reason that's just out of control so what happens when this necessarily causes immense devastation and health ramifications to the people that are eating the food and to the farmers that are applying these microbes well nothing because the system right now is rapidly moving to pass liability protections Bayer themselves drafted the legislation, which is a, um, it's called a pesticide liability shield, but it's not about protecting profits for pesticides. It's about preparing for the deployment of this microbial infrastructure that we see, you know, the WEF and the Gates Foundation and all these agendas, uh, what firmly integrated, what was it? This is now firmly integrated into the global agenda. That's why liability protections are going into place. Um, liability protections drafted by the very companies that are making these microbes. And uh, what that signals is that this is a deployment of a new kind of microbial critical infrastructure for the systems of tomorrow and we'll talk more about that in the next video because i don't want this one to get any longer so my friends this is some pretty wild stuff thanks for sticking with me through it uh, we're witnessing in real time right now the deployment of a planetary scale microbial infrastructure and in the next video we'll talk more about how that infrastructure will ultimately comprise microbes that are sensing and reporting on their environment up into a beastly AI system and uh, what that means. You can find this report and all my reports on unshadowed.org. And again, if you value this information and if you appreciate this broadcast, please do help me keep it running. I need your support to do this. This is weeks of research in this report. So I very much appreciate your support. All right, for now, keep those gardens growing and be well.